I'll, I'll tell you, Leighton, and this this sounds like hyperbole unless you were me while it happened, but it, re it literally felt like once we boarded that plane from Vancouver going towards Seattle, like we had escaped communism. I am a husband, a father, a lawyer, a Christian, and a proud Canadian. I started this series because it was clear that our nation needs truth. Not just another biased narrative, but real information of substance. We need access to facts and the freedom to think for ourselves. I'm Leighton Gray, and this is Gray Matter. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gray Matter. Well, we talk a lot about social disorder on this program, as you know. We talk about how it can be alleviated, how it can be ameliorated, how it can be extirpated and annihilated. And as you reach for your thesaurus, I'm going to welcome our guest, who actually is the host of the Social Disorder Podcast. He's a jiu-jitsu expert and author as well. Very pleased to have on the program my friend, Drew Weatherhead. Welcome to the show, Drew. I'm happy to be here, Leighton. Thanks for the invite. Yes, it's very excited to dive into our conversation. We've had a couple of great talks on your show, uh, one very recently, and uh, I hope to come back to some of the very interesting issues that we discussed on your show and also to talk about your two books, uh, which will be added to our reading list today. But before we do that, as we always do, we're going to turn to our framing aphorisms. And as I read these, Drew, it's going to be obvious that I actually did read your first book. I haven't gotten to the second one yet, but I shall. Uh, the first uh, quotation is from uh, Christopher Hitchens, who said in his last interview with Richard Dawkins before he died, he said, the to totalitarian to me is the enemy, the one that wants control over the inside of your head. Next one is from Richard Dawkins, who wrote, by all means, let's be open minded, but not so open minded that our brains drop out. I think I heard my mother say something similar <laughs> once. Uh, and then, of course, from Sam Harris. Our minds are all we have. They are all we have ever had. And they are all we can offer others. Mm -hmm. And finally, from Edward O. Wilson, who said, We have created a Star Wars civilization with Stone Age emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. So who do we have on the show today? Well, Drew Weatherhead. Uh, he, uh, facing the 2020 pandemic, Professor Drew Weatherhead closed his Central Alberta Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gym, moving to the U.S. with his family. Living in a trailer, he trains with BJJ legends to enhance his teaching. He's the creator of the Because Jitsu meme page and a full-time instructor. Uh, he's also created uh, something called the Social Disorder Podcast, uh, which he hosts. The Social Disorder Podcast goes deep into every kind of topic in an endless exploration of total reality. In addition to all of that, if that weren't enough, he's actually written two books. Uh, one of them we're going to talk about today, this new book is called Layers of Truth. But his first book, which I just had the pleasure of getting into over the weekend, I listened to it and he narrates it himself, which I really enjoy. It's called Consciousness, Reality and Purpose. Very, very fascinating book. We're going to come to those books in a moment. But we've, before we do that, um, I'd like to ask you, Drew, I, love, I want to get your take because I, I know you're not a legal expert, but I, you're a very deep thinker. Mm. Um, we just had uh, an announcement that two of the Coots for uh, prisoners, political prisoners, had been released as part of plea bargain deals. And then a couple of weeks ago, we had this Mosley decision out of the federal court in Ottawa, which essentially uh, hauled the liberal government up on the carpet and gave them uh, a legal spanking. Mm. My question for you is, is not necessarily a legal one, unless you want to go there, but I'm interested in because you're very you're very attuned to social issues, uh, cultural issues, uh, and and the psychology uh, of individual psychology and also sociology of the public, do you do you sense that this these decisions uh, have signaled a shift in public confidence in the criminal justice system, or or something else? What's your take on that? Well, first of all, I'm. Super excited to go over these topics with you because uh, we just had a conversation not too long ago on my show where all four were still incarcerated. And in the meantime, which is only a couple of weeks, really, uh, two of the four have been released. And from what I understand, they basically, the charges that were dropped against them were the ones of conspiracy to commit murder or something to that effect when it comes to RCPR. Quite, quite right. Yes. Yeah. And then yeah. they plead 
to minor infractions with firearms, essentially. And they are, Correct. I guess, on their short list to come out because of the time that they spent. And really, it seems to me like the job of holding them as political ransom, essentially, for a big slap on the sociological wrist for any Canadians who get uppity about their ideas and their government had been achieved at that point. And it was getting to the point where they were losing the balance and the balance was shifting more towards let these guys out. What are you doing? And very shortly after, it felt like there was a lot of pressure coming from all of the different social um megaphones that I hear, listen to, and read, it was all pointing towards, these guys are still in prison. These guys are still in remand. Why is it they haven't got any bail? Why is it they haven't got a court date? And all of a sudden, within like a few weeks of really, really pushing across the country, like, I mean, from east to west and all the people I was following, all of a sudden, shortly at, before, or maybe a little after the exact two-year mark, they're just like, two of them are just let go, and the other two have court dates all of a sudden. Like, it's strange to me I guess it's not strange, it's telling, right? Like the, the people in politics are paying attention. They act as if we have no real affect on them. And then they they actually act as if they do, as if we do. And you saw this after mm-hmm. the um, the trucker convoy was broken up too. This was, uh, the, it was being touted as a, a big win for the system and for the liberals and they've uh, remained or they've uh, brought back order to a disordered Canadian public and they've broken down all these you know would-be rioters etc and then all of a sudden province by province by province a bunch of mandates and restrictions started quietly dropping all at once because they knew that there was a spirit of defiance that was in the air that they didn't want any part of it was shown evidently at the capital and throughout different cities in in the the country and it's it's kind of the same thing where i feel like if the pressure because a lot of people that i uh talk to on the show and get um text messages through as listeners are saying what can i even do about these things because yes i understand that these things are going on and it bothers me to no end but i feel helpless i feel like i have no way of making any difference and there's this problem between like speaking to layers we were talking about layers of truth there's just layers of scale when it comes to what can i affect as an individual what can i do as a person down at the bottom of the hierarchy and as it turns out if enough of us get together and make a concerted push, it does have effect up the ladder towards the top where change happens. That's a, that, that's a very interesting take, particularly in the context of uh, just last night I had on my ex live space, uh, kind of a Q and a with people talking about this. And I would say that the, the jury was, was hung on whether or not this restored some of their confidence in the criminal justice system, restored some of their faith in government in terms of listening to us and the power of populism, which is sort of, I think, what you're talking about, or whether uh, on another view of the matter, maybe this was just a sign of, uh, of deeper corruption. And, you know, we've sort of gone, there's so many rabbit holes we can go, go down with this. But, um, you know, it, it's very interesting to hear people and, and their different uh, perspectives, because some of them are just never going to trust anything. Mm-hmm. They think, you know, the system is broken. Let's get rid of it. And then others are saying, you know, this is this is a good sign. You know, uh, you, they, they, you, their, their message is getting to the people in power that we don't like what's going on. It sounds as though you're sort of more in that camp. Is that a fair statement? Yes. And I wouldn't have been at the beginning of the pandemic for maybe the first two years. I was very black pilled about this. I was very nihilistic because it seemed like everything just kept getting worse and worse and compounding and making everything uh, slide further and further towards uh, some version of tyranny, if not totalitarianism. And it didn't seem like it was ever going to end. Like it got to the point that me and my family fled the country because I, I was not in any position to believe that my government wasn't going to come for me and my family individually at some point. It just seemed like it was continually moving in that order. So since then, so much has changed when it comes to the the lifting and demolition really of restrictions mandates but not even just at the uh implementation level of the government level whether it be provincial you know or national but the the zeitgeist of the culture is much more standoffish about these things i feel like at the very least they're agnostic they're not really interested in putting their mask on if they don't have to and and like those types of um social reactions to it i think it just 
the the totalitarian button was pushed too hard too long and people have sort of built up somewhat of an immunity to it um, at the individual and then of course as it presents at the cultural level mm -hmm. uh, now i wanted to sort of segue into something that uh, you've talked about uh written about called the crucifix bible mm -hmm. uh and uh, this ties into of course your jujitsu background and uh it made me think of something i i wrote a paper recently about um you know having a warrior mentality and i want to get your take on this uh so in in the paper that i wrote uh, i i quoted uh miyamoto musashi okay. a 17th century undefeated japanese samurai swordsman uh who expressed kind of this idea he said it is said that the warrior is the twofold way of pen and sword and he should have a taste of for both ways even if a man has no natural ability he can be a warrior by sticking assiduously to both divisions of the way. So the idea is that human beings are our souls inhabiting bodies. We are sp spiritual entities, psychosomatic synergies, bodies and minds. Our spirituality, psychology, and emotionality are, are mutually reinforcing. And how we move our bodies impacts how we think and feel and how we think and feel in terms affects how we move our bodies. So coming back to our earlier discussion, sort of the power of, 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 of populism, um, I wonder if you could maybe tie in the the, the concept of you know this uh, crucifix Bible with the idea of a person being um, let's say a, seeing themselves as a warrior as opposed to a victim of culture. Sure. You see where I'm going with yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm interested to get your take on this because it seems to me there's a connection between the idea that you've come up with and what I was writing about. Yeah, there's a lot that can be said about that. I just want to make one clarification. The Crucifix Bible is like a technique series for jujitsu. There's a position in jujitsu called right. the Crucifix. So it's just like three right. hours of instruction on how to use that position. But to speak to exactly what you're talking about, the historical and really the um, the prototypical position of the warrior poet is something that exists in societies across the world for a very good reason. It's not there as, as an abnormality. It's actually considered like one of those things. It's funny because um, I hold a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which took me 12 years to get to. And what I started noticing in the years after that, especially um, um, internally to myself, but also in other black belts that I was uh, conversing with more often was people tend to wane philosophical after they get past black belt. It's less about the technical aspect mm -hmm. because you've done all the techniques. You, you know, you, it, you get to this point where you're seeing the meta instead of the micro. And when you get to that level, it's, it's about a holistic system. And that type of holism is a worldview that actually it can be transmuted into other aspects around you. So I feel like, and you probably had this experience as an expert in your own right, when you get to an expert level in one thing, and I think that this is maybe true of anything worth getting to an expert level in, is there is some sort of transmutability between that and other types of systems because you've gone through the the process of you know believing you knew everything realizing you know nothing and coming back to the point where you thought you started from and in sure. that process uh it's something that has been done over time throughout history in all sorts of different cultures and it's something that we i think are coming back to or hopefully towards a, a more leveled homeostasis in the culture that we exist in right now. I mean, we could talk about the fourth mm -hmm. turning and the idea about the hard times that that make strong men. Um, we've gone through right. at least some limited hard times. I mean, I don't want to over exaggerate the pandemic because it wasn't the Second World War and it wasn't the Holocaust. You know, there, there's there's hard times I don't want to make comparisons to, but it's more about an emotional, physical and spiritual state of existing in hard times. Will it will, I guess, um, ossify the spirit in a way that is it becomes resilient and um there is a push right now i see this in social media and i see this just in culture in general towards a reaffirming of masculinity in our culture that has been uh, dissected right. out of it and part of yeah. that masculine ethos is that warrior spirit that is part of what we are mm -hmm. meant to be as protectors and warriors the warrior poet archetype in in the old testament obviously it's, it's someone like king david and I do, uh, I appreciate you saying that because I see the same sort of thing coming back. So uh, coming back to this this uh, sort of, let's say, a new consciousness that seems to be emerging in the Canadian polity, in the Western polity, but something else happened 
that is uh, sort of rel related to this and uh, or triggered this ongoing uh, tension in our society right now between the feminine and the masculine, which seems to intersect with everything that's LGBTQ. Uh, recently, Danielle Smith and your government brought forward a bill, a parental rights bill, which much like the don't say gay bill <laughs> in, in Florida, uh, got turned on its head and turned into something about um, uh, harming transgender kids. Um, looking at that bill, what are your thoughts about that and what they based upon what you've heard so far? Well, if anybody is an NDP maximalist here, they can plug their ears because I don't think that they went far enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, look, look, hats off to Danielle. I think she did amazingly. There were some concessions that I feel like could be tidied up in the future, but all of the movements forward towards really, I think, sensibility when it comes to this topic, especially coming from the position of a parent with four kids. Um, and, you know, a lot of friends that have kids that are in the education system that are very concerned about the, um, whatever you want to call it, going on in there, that um, social contagion that their kids keep um, getting stuck in the milieu of. I think she did really the most sensible thing she could about some of the most hottest topic things. Like no politician wants to touch on any of these things if it isn't affirmation, right? Affirmation is the right. only mode in the wild west that we live in right now. We could call it the modern west, but it feels like the wild west right now because the rules are all being flipped upside down. And I mean, we could talk to the history of how culturally this has um, slipped into our culture where you know, basically since the 50s forward, there's been an infecting of uh, some version of neo-Marxism into the academies that has bled down. Social to, disorder. Exactly. Right. Social disorder. Exactly. Yeah. But it seems very innocuous because these are just people that are having ideas and talking about ideas at a high level at mm -hmm. Ivy League universities. But then it turns out that over the generations, more and more of their students go down into the lower education, which eventually leads to kindergarten where we're at right now, where they've got social emotional learning and they've got SOGI programs programs and they've got all of these things that have everything to do with um, critical theories, especially queer theory right now, which is the one that's, you know, uh, Danielle is trying to get some sense back from. And mm -hmm. like, it's very basic stuff. Like we shouldn't have people that were born physiologically male and transition themselves um, basically using hormones and, and surgical cosplay to go compete against actual like biological women in sport. That is a very sensible thing that anybody that watches it when it happens is outraged and, and rightfully so righteously outraged to watch these men go out dressed like women and absolutely blow the pants off of every other woman in their division because of course they're going to because there's biological realities. Now just to mm -hmm. say that we're not going to allow that in our province is it's wild that we live in a time that that's controversial. That seems very commonsensical, you know? And uh, the other things that she was talking about is like not allowing for puberty blockers below age 15, not allowing for uh, sex change surgeries before uh, 17, I think below 17. So again, these are, I think, very smart common sense things. Look, they're not saying you can't be trans. They're saying that maybe you should wait until you're an adult before you make major life-changing decisions. And none of this is new to society. We aren't allowed to get tattoos until we're 18. We aren't supposed to drink until sometimes 21 or 24 in some uh, places in the world. Like there are um, cultural contracts, social contracts that get written around very important decisions that young kids are not supposed to make. They shouldn't be trusted to make. And it's, it's crazy to me that we have to say that anymore. Uh, I want to, I want to tie this into a discussion of your first book, which is called consciousness, reality, and purpose. Um, it, it focuses on three of the most important and eternal questions human beings have, which are what is consciousness? What is reality? What is my purpose? And the book explores these questions that have spanned times, cultures, religions for as long as humanity has existed. And it delves deeply into, into, into these different things. But at the fundamentally, uh, at the base of what you talk about in your book is the importance of reason. You, you just talked about common sense, right? Um, the importance of reason and how that ties into uh, our sense of reality and purpose. Um, do you think that, or would you agree with me? I'll put it another way. Do you agree with me that 
part of what the left is trying to achieve when they come out in full force against uh, this bill, which I agree with you, should be unnecessary to protect children from, you know, trans from from mutilation of children is the outrage, the point, uh, you know, showing that this stuff is irrational. It's unreasonable, indeed dangerous when you start when you start talking about, you know, men competing against women in sports is outrage part of the part of the point in terms of causing the social disorder. Yeah, from the position of the critical theorists and their um, activists that implement this stuff into society, that is absolutely in their handbook of what to do. They literally have handbooks of how to do good activism when it comes to this stuff. None of this stuff is done by accident. It's very purposeful when they go to protest that they wear a mask. It's very purposeful that they don't give interviews. There's a whole lot of things that are checklists of things they do and don't do. And um, one of those things that uh it's it's a sort of a truism among them they their uh euphemism for it is your reaction is our real action so they want to go Mm. into a place and they want to agitate to get a reaction because then they win this is like people do this in hockey right it's never the instigator it's the retaliator that gets the penalty and and this counts for social points people look at oh you um you know they set the table with some sort of um you know uh, some word, um, I, I call it term warfare. They have set the terms for the table before you get there to do battle. And they set it up in a way where they're the empathetic party every single time. And you're going to have to start from the back foot. And in this case, it's, oh, you're pro trans suicide, you know, and they set that up. And all of their placards say that is um, trans rights is counter is anti suicide. And it's all coming back to you can't be the anti that right it's just like uh black Mm -hmm. lives matter of course but we're going to start from a position that if you oppose us you're saying that black lives don't matter this is um the way that they set it up they set it up so that they can get reactions from people and and it's the same thing with their actions um and i'm not just making this up this isn't conspiracy theory stuff it's literally written out there for people to go look i forget the name of their handbook but there is a handbook you can find online that has all of basically antifa's ways of dealing with um social uh displays uh, and um activism in in the public and so to to speak directly to your question again is the outrage the point so long as the outrage makes them look like the victim yes that's the goal right yes and you know the other thing that's uh i would say a feature not a bug of of this protest whenever we see it is it's always left-leaning we started off in uh, in my framing aphorisms, the one from uh, the late uh, Christopher Hitchens, where he says, you know, and this is as he was leaving life uh, uh, on, on the planet, because of course he was an atheist. He thought he was that was the end of the line. He says totalitarianism, that's that's his deepest concern. That's at the base of everything. And all these protest movements are always left-leaning. They're always about power, aren't they? That That's a feature, not a bug. Would you agree with that? It is uh, one of the axioms of their worldview is that from the Marxist, socialist, communist perspective, everything comes down to power. From the Nietzschean perspective, everything comes down to power. And those that have power are essentially the enemy because it, people, you know, become totalitarian with power. And But the, the redefining of what power is, is where the real play happens. So when you're looking at critical theorists, look at uh, critical race theory, for example, they say that whiteness is a version of power it's privilege right and you don't even have to be white it's actually hilariously racist to say that whiteness is um evil essentially and and literally that is what like go read any of the literature that you want about um apologizing for being white but what's interesting is when you actually look in what they mean by these words it has nothing to do with what they're talking about there are black people that can have whiteness you know and this is basically in their Um, perspective. We live in a society built by colonialist European whites. And because it was built upon that superstructure, it has to be crumbled down to the basement before we can rebuild and be free of this system that is, uh, you know, it's 
got us in the grips of its power clutches of whiteness. And this is, uh, I mean, it, it is prototypical of what communism and totalizing socialism wants to do and that, that they did do in the Soviet Union back starting in 1917. Like there's a reason why the actual first major communist country started with a revolution. And that's what they want. That's what they need. All of their literature points towards we need revolution. We're going to build up a proletariat of disabused people, whether it's economically or in this case, identity wise, you're disabused of power because of where you were born. And because of that, you were gay, you were female, you were black, you were Phil in the blank of all the disabused of power people groups and they combine them they congeal them into one big proletariat to get angry at the system to cause revolution and then if you look at what happened in mao's china immediately after revolution finally happens they all get wiped off the board because it's a totalitarian comes in and takes off where they left off so thanks i'll take it from here we're going to rebuild it in my image and that's basically always the pattern that's totalizing communism and, and socialism leads towards Mm -hmm. We had a discussion uh, last time I was on your program. People should check this out about uh, someone named Vesmanov and how this has been imported into the West, specifically into, into Canada, this process of demoralization. But I want to come back, Drew, if I could, maybe to your origin story. Obviously, you're a very accomplished athlete and instructor. And I shouldn't call you instructor. Actually, you're a master uh, of your martial art. But how, and you're also very early though to the podcasting game. Um, how did that come about for you? How did you transition from uh, being a, an elite athlete, instructor, and master of martial arts and starting out with uh, podcasting? <laughs> yeah, um, it was definitely not a linear uh, path, and it wasn't even like a, let's call it a smart way of going about things in the time that I did it, it was necessary for me. And that's really the only real answer. It was necessary. And it became necessary for me to do this after I had already basically lost everything during the pandemic. I had my own um, gym, my own academy that I was the sole proprietor of. And it was like my pride and joy and spent all my money and put all my sweat, blood and tears into this thing for about two years before the pandemic hit. And um, at that point, you know, gyms were not a good position to be in when it came to social distancing, when it came to saving grandma, when it came to two weeks to flatten the curve. We got hit about as hard as any other industry out there is like gyms were anathema, which is, of course, hilarious looking objectively and even scientifically at being that a strong immune system through physical exertion is one of the, you know, uh, fundamental ways to not only avoid but uh, beat quickly any sort of respiratory or otherwise seasonal bug. But all that aside, um, socially, I found myself basically trapped more or less perpetually on and off for about 17 months in an empty gym. And in this uh, impossible scenario where you're not allowed to work to make money, but also you have to pay all the bills. And so we tried every possible trick that we could think of and some that we had to think of on the fly and we shouldn't have even lasted as long as we did to be honest but we made it about 17 months into that process where i finally had to fold the business um and we sold our house because there was no other money left we had you know ex gotten through all of our savings we had gotten through all of our uh, goodwill and loans and everything else and we we were just at an empty coffer at the end so we folded the business. Um, I sold my house and moved my family of six into a travel trailer. And we've been living perpetually on the road ever since. And we're coming up on um, three years this year <laughs> that we'll have been on the road, basically doing the fly by the seat of your pants thing ever since. Like we, I'd never owned a truck. I'd never owned a trailer before that. And I just moved everybody into it. And this I mean, is, this is like a net, this is like a Netflix documentary. <laughs> Somebody's got to yeah. film this. What's crazy too, is I did this in 2021. So to, to right. rehash the, the COVID eras, you know, there's eras and I sort of clock them by years the first year was the mask up and stay home era and then the second year the 2021 was the vaccine era and everything right. pushed around that thing and so if you didn't have that uh you know two shots of your novel genetic injection you weren't allowed to be a citizen at very meaningful levels and part of that was i couldn't get across the border um living in a in a trailer full time before the winter Comes. I just wasn't legally allowed to do that, but I had to physically do that because you can't winter in Alberta in a travel trailer. You freeze to death. And so mm -hmm. uh, by hook or by crook, I managed to get my 
unit across the border from Alberta to Montana by leveraging a favor out of a friend who is a dual citizen, who they couldn't <laughs> deny him entry into his home country, being that he was born in America. So I just got something written up from a lawyer that said that, yes, you're allowed to drive my units across the border. He got kind of hassled at the border. They they went through it with the dogs and everything, but, uh, you know, barely got him across. I got a phone call the night that he was crossing because they didn't believe his story. And we like had to convince this cop in real time that's, you know, we're not trying to smuggle anything, et cetera. And then at like, this is well, I was, had my whole family in the hotel in Edmonton, ready to fly out 4 a.m. the next morning to Seattle, where I had to convince, basically do the same convincing to somebody at the border, at, at the customs, before I was able to fly from there to Seattle, which, by the way, I had to do within the next three weeks. Otherwise, I wasn't allowed as a citizen to fly anymore. So I had to get under the radar. We were three weeks before that uh, restriction came down on unvaccinated people. We all had to positive or I guess negatively pass PCR tests, including all my kids, which was cost prohibitive. That was extra thousands of dollars on top of the thousands of dollars for flights. And I mean, I'm not made of money at this point, to say the least. We probably lost 10 years of life out of stress (laughs) trying to get across the border. But I'll I'll tell you, Leighton, and this this sounds like hyperbole unless you were me while it happened, but it re- it literally felt like once we boarded that plane from Vancouver going towards Seattle, like we had escaped communism. And, and it again, wow. it, it sounds crazy to say that because everybody's like, well, it wasn't really communism and you're just, you know, you could have got the thing in state and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm, I'm telling you, when I saw the first American flag as we were touching down in Seattle, I, I had to fight back tears, man. Because wow. it felt like I had gotten free and hadn't been free for almost two years at that point. And I mean, it's it's something because it gives you perspective. And you know what's crazy mm-hmm. is the very same day, um, I guess it was the next day because we had to rent a van in Seattle when we landed and drive the same day to Montana to set up our unit on the other side. So it was like a 17 hour day from 4 a.m. till when we finally got to Montana. <laughs> but, Those poor kids. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there was um there was a point the next day because we had to go drop off the the rental van in a different city. It was in Missoula and we were staying closer to Kalispell. So we drive down mm-hmm. to Missoula and I got a friend that I only ever knew online at that point that we were going to meet up. I'm like, holy crap, we're in the same city. We should go meet up. And he says, yeah, go meet me at this Wendy's. It's close to the drop off space and we'll grab a bite to eat and, you know, we can meet the kids and the whole thing. Well, I get to this Wendy's and I get out of the truck and tell my eldest daughter, which at that point, I think she was nine years old. Yeah, because she's 12 now. So she was about nine years old. And she gets out of the truck and I say, "Um, Kyra, go into the restaurant, find us a table and sit down so that we've got a table. And she looks at me like I'm crazy. And she says, Daddy, I'm, are we allowed in there without the thing? At nine years old, she knows that she as a person isn't allowed inside a public restaurant without a vaccine passport. And I looked at her and I said, not only are you allowed to go into this restaurant, but you don't even have to wear a mask. And she looked at me like I just told her that the pandemic was over. Just the smile Mm -hmm. on her face and just like the authenticity of joy that I hadn't seen. She hadn't seen most of her friends for most of that time because it it was essentially quasi illegal to do so. And Mm -hmm. it literally all we were was on the same contiguous mass of dirt, but across an invisible line. So when I say that it sounds hyperbolic that we escaped communism, there's no physical objective reason why it should feel that way if it weren't for the subjective rules that were imposed upon us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the stories of, you know, the Cold War, people escaping through Czechoslovakia into Austria. Or during the World War II, people going over the Alps to get out of Germany into Switzerland. Um, it, it, it's, it really, I wish it were hyperbole, but um, of course, as someone who's written books about consciousness and purpose and reason, you know it's not. These things impact the human psyche, personality in ways that uh, we don't fully understand, but we know uh, impact who we are and who we become. And so, uh, wow, I just pray that 
uh, your children can can over overcome this. Obviously, they've had a wealth of experiences yeah, traveling you know, around they've, they've in that very, travel trailer. They've been very blessed to see most of the United States for the last two and a half years at this point. And I mean, the, the geographic education that they're getting is beyond anything I had when I was growing up. I didn't even get on an airplane uh-huh. for the first time till I was in grade 10. And I think I didn't get on one after that till I was like 25 years old. So they're, right. they're getting a great education in that sense. But I just realized that I didn't actually answer your question of how I yeah the, about the podcasting. podcasting. So yeah, because you were all the way back in in 2021. Yes, yeah, uh, well, which is by you're early to the game, it seems. Um, uh, interestingly, I didn't start podcasting the podcast that I'm doing right now until the beginning of 2022, and there's a story behind that because I had a jujitsu podcast before that that was just a solo podcast right. talking about what's yeah. going on in jujitsu. But besides the fact that not a lot of jujitsu was going on at that point, it felt like I was sort of speaking to an empty room more or less. Everybody was stuck at home and doing like the restrictions thing. A lot of gyms weren't even open because they had to do social distancing, which is impossible when you're trying to grapple somebody you can't stay six feet apart at that point but you know people i know you don't want to boast but people should understand you we were all the way at the level of being a professional mma fighter that's how that's how how yeah i had you were in the sport i right? had i had a stint doing pro mma when i was younger and uh, my bones didn't creak so much <laughs> that was something that i <laughs> kind of bucket listed i wanted to do before i got too too old but um at the point that i was across the border finally it felt to me like like doing a jujitsu podcast was there was no purpose for it it felt like it was right. more of a task and it, it had no life there was no passion for it anymore because i was literally fleeing the country of my origin and on the run more or less while talking about what's going on in jujitsu it just didn't feel authentic to me and i'm big when it comes to authenticity and i don't know if that's something that was bred into me from my parents or if it was something that's just part of my character but i don't like lying. I'm not very good at it to begin with. So it feels better when I'm just speaking honestly and truthfully. And and there was a point that we were driving through, I believe it was uh, South Carolina on the way to the coast. And this was February of 2022. And that date might ring a bell, not the least of which because we're coming up on an anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. But um, the fact that it was the 13th of February when I started the very oh. first episode, which was literally the day before the invocation of the Emergencies Act. And wow. I started the podcast, I rebranded my jujitsu podcast. So I'm speaking to a jujitsu crowd when I'm starting to talk about the totalitarian incursion that's happening right now in my home country from a country that I've fled from it. And, and to be honest, it felt like I said necessary. I had to do this because I had somewhat of like a survivor's guilt thing going on where I'm watching. I would love to have been in those protests because it was my spirit. They were my spirit that I felt like I was them and they were representative of me, but I couldn't. I was physically unable to be there. And I'm like, what can I do if not to just sort of vent everything out into the ether at this point? It's the only thing I have left to do. And so Mm -hmm. I, I started and the very first episode was called The Elephant in the Room. And I just, I ranted for about 45 or 60 minutes uh, monologue about everything that I had experienced and had felt and the ossification, um, you know, socially, the the fact that my sister was vaccine injured and we weren't allowed to talk about it. Like the types of nonsense that we had to go through and act as if nothing was going on was beyond morosely comical. It, It was inhuman and i felt the indignity of it all sort of pour through me during that episode and i remember after i finished that episode it was just recorded on my phone app it was just my my voice recorder app i had no real equipment i had you know nothing really uh, flashy to do this but i already had the jujitsu podcast set up on my my broadcaster so i i made this podcast i knew it was going to an audience i was going to have very mixed reviews in fact from my position i felt like i was going to burn everything to the ground because everybody's going to think that i'm an <laughs> anti-vaxxer and an anti-masker and an anti 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 and all of these things that you're supposed to be canceled for. Um, and I pressed publish on that and went in back, back into my trailer at like 9 p.m. at night thinking, I've just burned down the last bridge that I had to the only major connection to humanity left being the jujitsu <laughs> field. But interestingly enough, and this was, I guess, um, a fractal example of what happened during the Freedom Convoy, I, to me, There's so many things that you could talk about about the convoy because it was like that three week expedition across the country. But to me, the most valuable part of that whole thing was the trek from West 
to right. east and crossing small towns across mm -hmm. a highway and seeing overpasses littered full 40 below kids in right. in parkas holding canadian flags and yeah. to me i was like i'm not the only one and there was so yes. much atomization that happened and and this gaslighting that you're the crazy one that should shut up online in this sort of digital environment that wasn't real when in reality so many other people were in the same boat and i think the biggest and most powerful galvanizing force of the pandemic maybe even globally you can make the argument that what canada did made waves globally for the same type of spirit to emit itself was that reunification of all of the atomized individuals that thought that they were the crazy one and had been you know got that basically stockholm syndrome or, or gaslighting syndrome where they felt like maybe i'm the, the one that's wrong during this and you started to see physically see and those people that were in the convoy physically feel the hugs of people that they weren't allowed to hug a year before that and and were led to believe didn't exist they're the only crazy one and they got together in the thousands and yeah. for me even removed down like a country apart maybe 10 states in between i could feel that the power of unity and that canadian spirit it wasn't just a freedom spirit this was the canada that i loved before the pandemic i right. i never considered right. myself hyper patriotic but i found out when it got torn away from us that being canadian is something special and we were I told we were told that it goes no deeper than you know bacon syrup and hockey what it turns out that there is something that is really powerful and precious to the canadian spirit that that is what rose up against this infection that was taking over ottawa and pretending to be canada and this is what you talk about a lot on your podcast which is now into the hundreds of episodes yeah we're coming up on 500 you're, you're, now yeah wow congratulations and your following has just grown and grown and uh i know that you do now public speaking uh i saw you at an event uh uh, and uh, you're you're just as uh, as effective and impressive public speaking as you are on your show. Um, but you know, coming back to your first book, how what was the timing and what was the impetus for writing your 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 first book? I'm now talking about consciousness, reality, and purpose, which, by the way, folks, is available on Amazon. There's an audio book. There there's a there's a paperback version. Is it available in hardcover as yes. well. Yep. True. Yep. All yeah. different versions. So any any format you want that book i i listen to the audio version i i love listening to audio versions i don't know if you're the same way i'm the same way yeah yep. i love listening to books when they're narrated by the author because i just find i get a different quality yep and i really had a sense i want to say this about your book and i, I want to see if maybe if i got this right um uh, what i really enjoyed about your book is as deeply and as thoroughly thought out as it is and as well researched as it is and is um coherent as it is in terms of the the basic principles of of psychology and spirituality that you discuss it's also very digestible mm. it's not a book you know i'll give you an example um jordan peterson has written two really good books and one that isn't worth reading i <laughs> maps of meaning. i know the one you mean yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah maps of meaning it's just you know it, it's like reading a, a manual for a bmw in german yeah even if you can read german it would be boring i, I think the audio book is not like, like 35 that. hours long or something <laughs> yes and and you know god bless him for thinking through things so deeply but your book is not like that your book to me uh is a wonderful introduction to uh, to these concepts that you're talking about uh but also very very well constructed and that it's connected to some of the the deepest thinkers uh of our time and from our past you talk about people like socrates and aristotle was that what you were trying to achieve when you wrote the book um well first of all uh the the structure of the book was something that i'm, I'm somewhat of a pattern enjoying individual i like a good pattern it it, it soothes my mind if I can see the pattern before I get into something or if I see a pattern as I get into something. And for me, um, I knew the three major topics that I wanted to cover. Consciousness, reality and purpose is literally the name of the book. It's there's there's no real uh, filler over top of that. And right. I knew that I wanted three focuses in that book. And then I just started subdividing. I said, OK, so, so for each of these three uh, sections, I want uh, three larger categories underneath them. And on each of those categories, I want three chapters within them. So before I ever put the first word to, uh, I was going to say paper, but to computer, <laughs> um, I knew I was going to have 27 chapters because it was three, three, three. 
And uh, that made it very easy for me because I could see the end and how far I was along before I ever started. So that helped whatever version of ADD I have. It soothed me in that I could see my progression along the way. And yeah, to speak to your Mm -hmm. point to the digestibility, I didn't want any given chapter to be that long. I wanted people to be able to sit down and easily read a chapter very quickly. There's nothing longer than like 2000 words in any of the given chapters. So you can read that. It it has great, it has great pacing too, in the way it's Mm. written. Uh, I don't know if you intended that, but I found that uh, I was kind of catching most of what you were throwing at me. Uh, maybe yeah. that was by accident, but that was the impression. Hopefully. I had yeah. That's just, it's the way that my mind works. And I, I do this with jujitsu as well, because I, I taught jujitsu long enough that I, I recognized certain patterns of efficiency and of efficacy that if I stuck to those patterns, people did better faster. And that was my goal. My, my, my job as an instructor is to not just give people information, but to make it as accessible to as many people as possible in as small a time as possible as I can possibly do. And that's a, an incredible and continuous effort in efficiency. And so that was my goal with, and I think it just became my my MO, to be honest. Uh, the way that I instruct right. is the way that I teach is the way that I podcast, where I, I know what I'm aiming for and I try to be I, people are going to laugh because my podcast is less than concise. It's, it rambles for sure, but I do try to be concise. I, I want to poise um, where I want to go. I have notes every time so that I don't get too far off on a tangential rabbit trail. But um, I do uh, that. That's again, it soothes whatever my um, psychological faculties are, are built out of whatever type of brain cancer makes me do the things I do. Um, it feels better to have a system to it and have it systemized and ordered. Yeah. And I mean, that's a very Jordan Peterson thing too, is you're sure. going to be able to lessen your anxiety the more you lessen chaos and the more you um, appeal to order. And of course, there's, you know, there's too much order where it becomes dictatorial and you have to find that balance point. And that's been part of the the struggle and and the adventure in doing this so far and then to speak to your question of why I did a book um it's it came out of me and I think I told you a little bit about this when you were on my show because it was an emergent thing that I I had never had the impl- uh, inclination to be an author I didn't even think that was a thing that a person could do I thought an author was a thing that authors are you know what I mean it felt like like authors do authoring I'm not an author so I'll, mm-hmm. obviously I can't author something but as it turns out and especially in the technological world we are at you can just self author anything that you want it just Amazon. means creator that's, that's it just means all creator actually yeah yeah, yeah. And I'm sure my uh, grammar and and English teacher would laugh that I wrote a book, but uh, it turns out when it's a topic that I love and am passionate about, uh, I'm very interested in doing a good job. And to speak back to the point, it is very, it's a, it's a very well-written book. Well, I appreciate that. Um, To speak back to the why, and this is the important thing, and it's something that I know that you vibe with as well, because you talked about your podcast um, giving uh, value to your day job, to your lawyer position. Um, I right. felt like this was something that was using me as the pen. It wasn't me finding a pen. I was the pen for the thoughts that had to get out. It felt like I was trying to hold back a wellhead of thought that was mm-hmm. happening because at about leading up to the point that I was coming up on episode 200 of my podcast, think of like nearly 200 conversations and monologues and all of that information rattling around in whatever our, our you know, neural network is doing up there. And it's not something you can put to bed. In fact, it comes alive when you go to bed and it starts talking to itself. And I feel like there were different ideas and disparate thoughts um, schools that were arguing and finding um, pathways through the similarities of each of them back and forth without me doing it. This was an autonomous thing. Like I said, it was yeah. emergent. At a certain point, I was like, I have to get this out and podcasting isn't helping. How can I get this out? (laughs) And so I was like, I'm just going to write it all down. And and by the time that I did, I I swear I'm not, again, I sometimes come off hyperbolic, but the moment I typed the final three words in my book, I had such a rush of relief. And it wasn't that Mm -hmm. I was under a deadline. It was that I'm done. I finally did the thing that was that was pushing me to do it. It didn't, it felt Mm -hmm. like it had to come out of me. And I was more like the, Mm -hmm. the method for which it could become 
objectively real instead You're of the just, medium. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and some people think that's woo woo, but until you experience it, <laughs> I would have been the person to say well, that that was woo woo. You know, um, you know what I believe. You yeah. know what I believe oh, about where your, where your book absolutely. came from. Absolutely. And I, I'm. And this is not a fluffy book either, folks. Mm. Just to give you an idea, these are some of the topics that are covered: classical dualism, artificial intelligence, free will, lucid dreaming, quantum physics simulation hypothesis the mandela effect that one's really fascinating nikola tesla most of you know that name but maybe don't know uh, uh, the importance of some of his work manifestation psychology authenticity and sovereignty so th this is not uh you know we're not we're not skating on the surface here this is a deep dive into human human psychology and, and even explains i also really enjoyed your explanation of consciousness mm. Um, and I even tried some of the, I have been trying some of the exercises uh, that you talk about in your book in my prayer life. Oh, good. And I found that to be quite effective. So thank you for that. Mm. Yeah, no, um, a lot of these things are ideas from other people. And like I said, these disparate schools of thought that sort of introduced themselves to me and then started arguing with each other. Um, and the goal of that first book was not supposed to be explanatory. I didn't want to write an explanation. I wanted to present an exploration. I wanted people right. to also be introduced to a bunch of like very fascinating facets of reality and let them do with it as they will. I didn't, there was only yeah. one point where I even interjected my own thoughts on the matter. And that was, I think, chapter 15, where I was talking about how I right. perceived, I call it the terrarium, the idea mm -hmm. of, of a I higher power. That. And um, yeah. I've extrapolated on that more into the second book, which is was much more difficult yeah. to write than the first Let's talk one. about that, about the layers of Layers of truth. I've told you, I wish there was a W in the first word. Uh, <laughs> Lawyers of <laughs> but maybe, maybe somebody else have to write that. Book. But what's layers of truth all about? And how does it tie into, is it sort of a sequel to your first book or is it something different? So there is some carryover, but um, the first major difference between the two, like I said, the first one was not meant as an explanation. It was meant as an exploration. This is exactly the opposite. Right. I had to be uh -huh. explanatory when it came to my constructs that I was laying out about truth. And there were two major constructs that I laid out in that, and one of which is in the first book. So the first one that is not, though, is the name of the second book, Layers of Truth. And this is a, a construct that I'm trying to parse um, truth into where mm -hmm. I, I start from the premise that there is a total truth that exists, which is analogous to total reality. There must be something true right. about every given thing in total reality, which means there is a total truth about it and the synergy between all of the truths that, that make it up. The problem is that we can't know total truth, which means we cannot know, well, we cannot know total reality, which means we cannot know total truth. So we find ourselves in a, a position of subjective um, observation. And this is inevitable. We can't get away from this. And so yeah. I, what I saw was a lot of people are, are becoming sometimes, uh, they don't do it on purpose. It may not be purposeful, but sometimes it is. They build a pseudo reality based upon what they can see and order it in a way to present a false version of objective reality that becomes very believable because the problem being that we're all subjective is our perception of what objective reality mm -hmm. is can inform what we actually act at and not just psychologically or spiritually even physically and i said this in the first book when i went into the placebo effect and the nocebo effect yes is you yes. can actually inform and we do constantly inform our our physiology based upon our mentality and what we believe will mm -hmm. actually affect our cells in our body but it's this synergy between everything where all we have is a subjective view of total reality. We can't have total reality. And some people are going to manipulate a version of what they say is actual reality and present it to people who don't know any better. And what I found is somewhat of an antidote to that is trying to parse reality into layers. Because what I found mm. was the the mode that people play with a lot, and I'm sure that you've had this experience ad nauseum as a lawyer, is that people will present a topic or an idea that exists as a, an objective truth at one layer, and then they will construe it or they will move it into another layer in the same sentence and hope that nobody sees the magic trick. 
And so yeah, I mean, judges, judges do that a lot. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the easy one that's speaking to social disorders that uh, we've already touched on on this show so far is the trans issue. What they're talking right. about and where the, the queer theorists try to relegate their ideas and their constructs are at the cognitive level. Oh, it's what you believe that you are. And gender is a construct. It's what we believe that we are. And they will then move that in the same breath into objective biological reality and expect for you not to see the trick. And I right. see this all over the place where if you actually bifurcate into multiple different layers of total reality, you can see where they are, um, where they connect naturally. And they can, you can very easily pick out where there is a conflation happening, whether in inappropriately or on purpose, you get malicious actors that will try to again, present a false reality and hope that you don't see the trick. And so that was the first thing was actually breaking apart and creating a construct of finding the layers in total truth. First of all, recognizing that you can't have them all and that we all have this sort of, um, you know, subjective version of different little points throughout them all that we build into our ontological tree of perception of reality. But then the second yeah. part of that, which speaks back to my first book, was the idea that I espouse that to have a well-balanced worldview, because we all have to build a worldview. We can't get away from it. Even if we don't consciously right. do it, we subconsciously do it all the time. We're building a subjective version of what we think reality is, and it's just our job. But I feel like to have a well-balanced version of that, it needs to include A, the scientific, B, the philosophic, and three, the theologic. And I call those the three pillars to a well-balanced right. worldview. And then I, mm -hmm. I basically amalgamate those two ideas together in that this uh, second book, I have five chapters as opposed to 27. It's totally backwards where I have five very large chapters <laughs> instead of 27 very small ones. The first one's an so introduction. like a Pentateuch. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> the first one's an introduction. The last one is a conclusion. And the three center um, focuses are truth and science, truth in philosophy and truth in theology. And I do them in that mm -hmm. order on purpose because I think that most people in the world we live in, in the modern West, in the modern wild West, they're very familiar and willing to bend the knee to the first one, science. The, the pillar of science right. tends to be a monolith for a lot of people that uh, have to pay homage to what is the orthodoxy of the science, right? The science is apparently a thing that we had to bow the knee to very recently here over the pandemic. And then yes. if we can move and, and expose some of the untruths and some of the manipulations that happen, and I go through several different examples, whether it was uh, lobotomies in, in the early 1900s or whether it was the thamel, uh, uh, th thalidomide scandal that happened in the 1950s and 60s or whether it was big uh, tobacco and the way that they used social manipulation and uh, lobbying to, to basically make people kill themselves in the hundreds of millions over an entire century. There's all of these failures of science science that I expose and then show, I, I try to show both the truth and the untruths in that pillar. But then once I move after that, it's to what I feel like is maybe the most important of the three pillars, because I consider it the mediator between the two poles, because I say that the scientific and the theologic are diametric opposites that are very difficult to talk back and forth from each other, because one of which the, um, the premise of science is that there, you cannot have faith in science. It has to be empirical. It has to be provable. It has to be disprovable. Right. We're trying to find what is objectively true and that's it. Don't bring your faith to the table, please, sir. And on the opposite side, literally the only thing that will allow you to be theologically involved is faith. You have to actually right. have faith as your foundation before you can even step foot into the theological. Mm -hmm. So how do you have conversations between those two and not just a war? Well, there's a mediator in between those of philosophy where the scientific mm. can speak to the theologic through the mediator of the philosophic and vice versa, where the theologic can speak to the scientific through the mediator of the philosophic. And I find that if we can introduce people to the philosophic because they're comfortable with the scientific, then there's an easy on-ramp from the philosophic to the theologic, where I was talking about certain authors and um, great thinkers that I'm sure that you have great respect for, like C.S. Lewis and uh, right. J.R.R. Tolkien, that I introduced mm -hmm. them at the end of the section on philosophy to on-ramp towards the, the theological. And it was a very easy on-ramp to make talking about Jung and the psychological uh, idea of right. the shadow self and moving that into the mm -hmm. esoteric as he did. 
um, it, it felt very natural. But to, to speak back to the point, this is a very difficult book to write compared to the first one. It felt like every single chapter got harder and harder and harder to <laughs> write because I knew what I wanted to do in them. But it, they're so deep and they're so important that I needed to do them right in a way that I was just so stressful to finally get to the end. And then, of course, the conclusion I had to tie everything back together. And like, I'm very excited to hear your feelings about it by the time that you're done reading it, because I sent you a pre well, copy. It's just in editing yeah, right now. It's I'm not publicly released. I hope there's a dedication there that isn't insulting. <laughs> uh, you know, um, I'm very, I'm very excited to read that book. It sounds like a really a brilliant way of, of connecting uh, those different sets of ideas. One of the things, talk about truth. As you know, uh, Socrates famously was praised as the wisest man in Athens. And he said, well, if I am the wisest man in Athens, it's because I know nothing. Yes. He wasn't saying that he didn't know anything. He was saying something else that you mentioned in your first book, and it really st stuck with me. And I want to share this with the audience because okay. uh, you paint a really fascinating picture. A lot of the people who are trying to sell us bad ideas start with the presumption that they know everything. And and uh, I forget which chapter it was in your first book. You say, well, let, let's say, for example, that um, it, being generous, that we know right now even half of all there is to know. And you say this is exceedingly unlikely, and I agree. That would leave another half of everything that is knowable and discovery and, and discoverable that we don't know anything about. And it could be that the most important things for us to know are in this half that we don't we haven't discovered yet. Or there may be really important truths in there that would modify everything that we think we already know. Uh, so and it seems to me that um that concept is sort of uh, uh, gets gets elucidated in your in your second book, mm -hmm. uh, where you're trying to figure. Okay, let's look at science and philosophy and religion and try to answer these questions about what we know and what we don't know. Is that a fair way, way of explaining it? Yeah, that is one of the most important things that I really wanted to get across in the first and second book. So firstly, I'm happy that that resonated from the first book because it was so important to me to try to lay out as as uh, efficiently and effectively as possible that we know basically nothing because we live again in this modern world where we feel like we're just the greatest um, blessing to planet earth, right? Even the word homo sapien uh, means wise ape. And in fact, we're actually considered a sub, really? yeah, we're considered a subspecies called homo sapien sapien, the wise, wise ape. Like we are so high on our wow. own supply when it comes to how great we are. And I mean, there was a, a saying that C.S. Lewis coins called chronological snobbery. And I believe that that is in full effect right now, where we believe that we are so smart because we're the most modern humans. And we have completely left aside to, to follow all of the great wisdom of the past, whether you want to go back to the Bible, whether you want to go back to the classic philosophers or the Stoics, or whether you want to go back to the Buddhists, there is so much great wisdom about being human that we've just like either forgotten to carry on or we think is rubbish because we're just so smart and i wanted to build in as as firmly as possible that not only are we not that smart but our belief that we are smart is maybe the dumbest thing that we have and this this idea i mean michael malice did it great on a podcast with jordan peterson recently he said that the smartest person on planet earth is ignorant of 99.99999% repeating knowledge they they're ignorant of almost all of it the smartest person on earth so how can you trust our knowledge when it comes to important things and i feel like this is the value of the theological as it comes down to faith because you can't rely sure. on your objective empirical understanding of things which is always fallible redefinable it's you know defined in certain mm -hmm. parametized terms that you can't step outside of and and i think that most of reality exists outside of those in fact i yeah. started the first book with a a, a bit from hp lovecraft that i finished the second book with so i, I kept those in both books and i'll I'll try to recite it uh, here, nice kind of. Energy. Yeah, yeah. It was it was very important to me that I put that in the book. I'll try to uh, paraphrase it a bit. He said, "It's the most, um, it's the most beneficial thing." I think uh, the the idea that man can't correlate the contents of his own mind. We exist in placid islands of ignorance amongst seas of infinity, and we weren't meant to travel far. The sciences, each in their own right, have hitherto harmed us little, but someday the piecing together of 
disassociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we will either flee from the light of knowledge or we will, um, I forget the last bit here, we will either, oh, we will either go mad from the revelation or we will flee from the revelation into the peace and darkness of a new dark age. And I, wow. I feel like this is the path that people go if they rely simply on the intellectual to guide the way. There is more to reality mm -hmm. that, that is the majority of objective reality. And there's a term that I, I bring up in the second book that I think is important because when I was talking about truth, I wanted to define my terms at the beginning. I think it's very important to define terms, as you would know as a lawyer. And... The word truth was not good enough for me. I speak English, unfortunately, and no other languages, but I wanted a better word than truth to define the idea that I wanted it to embody. And I went through a bunch of different languages and what their ideas and uh, their verbiage around the word truth was. And I landed on one from the Hebrew. And there is a word in Hebrew called emet. And emet is, is consisted of the first, the middle, and the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And it's done that mm. on purpose to represent that this is the total truth. It is the beginning, the middle, and the end. This is all of objective reality. And this right. is to me a, a uh, it is basically a version of God. God is all. It is everything. The alpha and the omega. Absolutely. Exactly. And this concept c pops up all over the place. And I wanted truth to be so immense and for people to understand how small they were in comparison to that to set the stage for where we are where we can't get out of with our subjectivity to it but also that that necessary uh, humility that is i think missing broadly when it comes to the modern west mm -hmm. well the, that's uh very very fascinating sort of reminds me of what wise old king solomon said about you know, the, 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 the beginning of wisdom is knowledge of God. Mm. Um, and of course, that's what I believe. That's what uh, Christians believe. Um, and of course, within the Gospels is the truth, the way, the truth. Uh, and that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for those who have accepted him as their Savior. Well, Drew, um, this has been a wonderful conversation. I knew it would be. I'm very glad that we got to talk about some things that we didn't get to uh, when you were kind enough to host me on your show. And I'm also very glad that we got to talk about your books uh, because uh, your podcasting audience, uh, I know that they're very faithful and they, they love to engage with you on your show, but maybe they're not as familiar with your books. And I'm also, uh, I also pray that we've been able to introduce some people you haven't met yet uh, to your tremendous work. Uh, because uh, I admire you and what you're doing very much. And I think it's important work, um, the, the work that you're doing, uh, both on your podcast and also in your in your writing. And as someone who is a spiritual, I see you as a spiritual leader uh, in our community, and our community of Canada and Alberta. So thank you for being on our program today. And, and I'm so grateful for all that you do. You really are a great example of what can be done uh, even under very, very difficult circumstances. Uh, you know, I think uh, you, you're a great example of what can be done if we understand what our personal power is. We see ourselves as, as having a purposeful life. If we see ourselves as having something meaningful to offer others. And uh, you've really lived out all of that. So uh, I'm looking forward to reading your second book. And again, I want to thank you very much for being our special guest here today on Grey Matter. It's absolutely my pleasure. And thank you so much for all the compliments. I um, Coming from you, especially, I, I tell my wife that I'm excited. I'm going to go on Leighton's podcast. He's like, he's uh, this great freedom lawyer, but also has a PhD in philosophy. He's like the, the Jordan Peterson of lawyers. So I was very excited. <laughs> well, I'll take, that's a nice compliment. I'll take that one any day. <laughs> Although I hope I don't get in as, as much trouble with my professional <laughs> society as Jordan is right now. I wish him well. Godspeed with that. But thanks again for being on our show, Drew. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on to engage in this discussion with you. Anytime. 